now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Jean-Pierre Dupre, who's from Laval in Quebec City. Um, and I think he was one of actually the first to report on uh, what we now know as visceral obesity uh, being in detrimental. But I think the best way to summarize uh, his um, expertise and renown in this area is to note that he has, uh, I love this, an H index close to 160, which many of us would love to have, and one of the most uh, cited active scientists at the University of Laval. It's a pleasure to have you here, and thanks for coming across the water. Thank you so much, Dr. Yellen, for this kind invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to give a talk in front of a live audience, finally, after two years and a half. And just listening to the first talk was really worthwhile to, to come here. I'm very much looking forward to learn a lot uh, today. Um, the point that I was asked to, to address was uh, a, a talk about uh, a lifestyle, and the first speaker emphasized the importance of, of the exposome. And in this area of uh, precision medicine, let me propose to you that we need to move from talking about obesity to refer to obesities, because it is an heterogeneous phenotype. And I was also uh, asked to uh, talk a, a little bit about the, the uh, metabolic uh, syndrome. Uh, those are my disclosures. They are not relevant to the, the talk that I will give uh, uh, this morning. Now, all of you are very familiar with this J-shaped curve showing you the, the relationship between the traditional index used to assess normal weight, overweight, and, and, and obesity. And on the basis of this uh, relationship, we, I guess we all agree that uh, losing weight is, is a good idea if you are uh, someone with a high BMI and uh, characterized by by cardiometabolic uh, risk uh, um, factors. However, when I started uh, exploring the link between overweight, obesity, and uh, risk factors uh, more than 40 years ago as a, a graduate uh, student, I was uh, perplexed by the, by the fact that uh, some individuals actually were, were obese and were not showing marked abnormalities in their cardiometabolic risk profile, was others uh, were really in the normal uh, BMI range, and they were characterized by altered uh, cardiometabolic risk factors. Now, you know very well as, as clinicians that age, sex, smoking, body composition are going to be a uh, modulating factor, uh, raising or lowering the, the risk of uh, uh, whichever clinical outcome associated with a given BMI. During my simple talk today, I'd like to emphasize the, the notion that uh, body shape, body fat distribution, uh, diet quality, physical activity, and cardiovascular fitness are also uh, very important uh, modulators of, of risk, and unfortunately, they are not systematically measured and, and target uh, currently in, uh, in clinical practice. Now, Dr. Yellen was, was kind enough to refer to my very old work on, on uh, using imaging to to uh, explore the link between overweight, obesity, and cardiometabolic risk outcome. The, the pioneer was uh, Dr. Yuji Matsuzawa, who was really the first uh, in 1983 using computer tomography to report these uh, spectacular difference in the way uh, people would put on abdominal fat. And he was uh, the first to suggest, it was almost an anecdote at the time on a couple of dozen patients, that this form of obesity, he described it as visceral obesity. Abdom abdominal cavity loaded with, uh, with uh, adipose uh, tissue, that this was the form associated with diabetes cardiovascular disease, whereas this massive accumulation of subcutaneous abdominal adipose tissue was not associated with the expected severe uh, alteration in the uh, cardiometabolic risk uh, profile. So uh, when I started my career in 1986 as an independent investigator, I started recruiting asymptomatic volunteers, men and women, and after a few years in the, the initial cohorts, uh, I quickly came to the conclusion that uh, uh, Dr. Matsuzawa was right. This is a, a, a simple example here of two individuals perfectly matched for the amount of total body fat. This subject here had a great accumulation of, of visceral adipose tissue, had elevated blood pressure and heterogenic uh, dyslipidemia, and therefore altered cardiometabolic uh, risk profile was this subject here was uh, 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 perfectly um, normal. And this is the, the first review. As you can see, it has been a while since uh, we have emphasized the, that we need to pay attention to that form of, of uh, uh, overweight um, obesity. 
We're jumping now a, a couple of decades. This is uh, an update that I published uh, 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 more than a, a decade ago, showing you the, the feature, what I've referred to as the minestrone soup of uh, atherogenic uh, inflammatory uh, dyslipidemic uh, uh, profile that we find among individuals with an excess accumulation of visceral adipose tissue. Please pay attention here. The previous speaker in his uh, very, very elegant talk has emphasized the importance of inflammation. This is a partner in crime in visceral obesity. We've reported the visceral obesity IL-6 CRP uh, axis to be present in those uh, um, subjects. And the lab also has been very much interested by the genetic and environmental uh, uh, variables involved in uh, uh, modulating uh, your, your susceptibility to put on subcutaneous or visceral uh, adipose tissue. Now here you recognize, obviously, features of the insulin resistance syndrome and features of uh, what we have been referring to as the uh, metabolic syndrome. We have proposed that you, know, you cannot dissociate those features from uh, an excessive accumulation of visceral adipose tissue ectopic fat. And because I was asked to briefly address the, the not to forget the, the metabolic syndrome, this is in, in, in my talk, let me pay tribute to uh, uh, Gerald Reven, the late Gerald Reven, who was really the first to suggest actually in his uh, Banting uh, lecture uh, in 1988 that insulin resistance was probably the most prevalent uh, uh, cause of uh, cardiovascular disease, even in the absence of type, of type 2 diabetes. And in, in, in uh, initial uh, concept, uh, he included whoops, sorry, the, the atherogenic uh, uh, dyslipidemia, fasting insulinemia as a crude marker of insulin resistance in non-diabetic individuals, and, and um, hypertension. But Jerry never put, actually, obesity as a key feature of his uh, syndrome XY. And I've had extensive uh, discussion with, with uh, Professor Reason on this issue. He said, JP, you know, I can find normal weight in individuals who are, who are insulin resistant and some obese individuals who are, who are not that insulin resistant. Well, it's because you're relying on BMI to assess normal weight and, and obesity. Had you performed imaging measurements, you would have found that uh, the vast majority of those insulin resistant individuals are characterized by an excessive visceral adipose uh, 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 tissue accumulation. Now, obviously, measuring insulin resistance required at least performing an oral glucose tolerance test or measuring, measuring in, in insulin or maybe some more sophisticated techniques, as you know, such as the euglycemic hyperinsulinemic glucose clamp. So uh, in 1999, um, uh, Scott Grundy put together a, a working group to try to figure out a simple way for clinicians to identify those individuals who would be abdominally obese and characterized by the insulin resistance syndrome. And those criteria of the uh, metabolic syndrome were, were uh, proposed. And I'll, I'll explain why waist circumference was uh, proposed as one uh, a tool to diagnose the presence of the metabolic syndrome. You recognize the high triglyceride, low HDL cholesterol dyslipidemia, the elevated blood pressure. Elevated fasting glucose, and on the basis of the data that they had at the time, they proposed that any three out of the five combination of those uh, criteria would identify a subgroup of individuals at increased risk for uh, cardiovascular um, outcomes. Now, there have been issues with the metabolic syndrome. As you know, countless papers, editorials have been published. This is not a risk calculator, you know, not putting. Uh, 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 the pathophysiology at the forefront, not making uh, abdominal obesity as a mandatory criteria is another um, issue. It does not uh, assess the severity of the, 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 the phenotype. If you're barely making the, the cutoffs for three out of the five criteria, as, a, as opposed to having the five criteria met with the value way overboard the, the cutoff, therefore you, you, you have a more severe form of uh, uh, the syndrome, and therefore it cannot be a therapeutic target. You have it or you don't have it after wh whichever um, intervention. And uh, the other thing that I actually I read a couple of decades ago in USA Today from an, a, a citation from a, an academic investigator well known in the US that I won't cite today, he said that, well, we cannot put abdominal obesity as a mandatory criteria for the metabolic syndrome because there's a lot of non-obese uh, people out there with the features of the metabolic syndrome 
probably true if you define it by a waist circumference being non-abdominally obese by having a waist circumference below 102 uh, uh, centimeters. And uh, to address this issue in a population-based study, a uh, representative sample of the adult population in the province of, of Quebec, uh, we have explored this, this issue here. What you have here are the various combination of three out of the five criteria that you could find in the province of, of, of Quebec. Some combination are included in other uh, combination. That's why some cells are, are missing. But you can clearly see that in the adult population of uh, the province of Quebec, if you don't meet the criteria of the metabolic syndrome, you have a much, much lower waist circumference than if you're meeting these criteria. And even you know, when waist circumference is, is not considered, you can see that the waist circumference uh, values are elevated, maybe not meeting here 102 centimeters, but bottom line from this slide is that the the most prevalent form of the metabolic syndrome is found among those individuals who have a, a large waistline due to excessive accumulation of abdominal visceral fat. Now, going back to the minestrone soup, uh, some of those features, we have a, a prospective observational study that we uh, performed in the mid-90s. We've published several papers at that time in the mid-90s where we were able to look at the the association between some of those features of the insulin resistance or metabolic syndrome and uh, risk of uh, incidence of uh, coronary heart disease. And in one of these uh, papers uh, published, as you can see in, in JAMA 23, uh, 25, almost 25 years ago, we found that this triad of having fasting hyperinsulinemia and non-diabetic individuals is a very crude marker of being insulin resistant, having elevated ApoB and small dense LDL particles was associated with a 20-fold increased risk of, of coronary disease. Now, I'm not showing this whole slide to emphasize that we need from now on in, clinic, in primary care clinical practice to measure insulin and particle size. This is just to show you that some of these features that we find among individuals with an excess of visceral adipose tissue are predictive of an increased, substantial increased risk of uh, coronary heart disease. Now, since then, uh, uh, obviously, the, the early work has emphasized the, the, the link, uh, documented the link between excess visceral adiposity and insulin resistance, glucose intolerance, type 2 diabetes, and various manifestations of cardiovascular disease. There's uh, evidence now linking this to respiratory uh, disease, such as uh, sleep apnea, impaired brain health, re reduced cognitive function, uh, increased risk of, of dementia and some forms of cancer. So you can really see that out there, you know, those individuals, irrespective of their BMI, uh, who are characterized by excessive accumulation of visceral adipose tissue and ectopic fat, this is a highly prevalent condition associated with highly prevalent uh, chronic societal um, diseases. Now, in 1994, in order to go beyond the inability of the BMI to discriminate for risk, we, we propose uh, 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 to add waist circumference to the BMI. We never proposed that waist circumference should replace the BMI, and this is why. Uh, in a, a large cohort here, more than 60,000 uh, men here, you can see the relationship between BMI and waist circumference and the correlation. Look at whichever cohorts around the world would be around correlation coefficient of 0.85. So if you only use waist circumference as an isolated metric, it's like measuring the BMI. However, once you have established the BMI of your patient, you can see here, if you look at the box and whisker plot, constable individual variation in waist circumference within a single BMI unit. So once you have established the BMI, if you position your patient in terms of quartiles, of quintile, of waist circumference, this will refine risk assessment. And I'll show you a slide to emphasize this notion that waist circumference should not replace the BMI, but should be added to uh, the body mass index uh, measurement. And since we are in the UK, I want to pay a tribute to Margaret Ashwell, who was really the proponent of uh, measuring waist circumference in, in clinical uh, practice here in the UK.
Now, why is excess visceral adipose, uh, as adiposity bad? Well, when we uh, study these uh, fat cells uh, obtained from an antral adipose tissue, they have distinct metabolic properties. They are characterized by a hyperlipolytic state re resistant to the antilipolytic effect of insulin. They are loaded with uh, inflammatory uh, macrophages, so this is the hypertrophied uh, uh, fat cell from the mental adipose tissue. This, this is uh, uh, promoting a pro, uh, an inflammatory state. Uh, there's also evidence that excess visceral adipose tissue accumulation is a marker of dysfunction of subcutaneous adipose tissue. I'll show you a couple of slides on that. And therefore, because of this lipid spillover and accumulation of fat in normally lean tissues, such as the liver, the heart, and the muscle, excess visceral fat accumulation is also a marker of ectopic fat deposition, and it could be also a marker of our quote-unquote toxic lifestyle, and these are not exclusive uh, scenarios, probably, probably a combination of those factors explain why putting on uh, 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 fat in the abdominal cavity is, is, not, is not a good thing. And this is just a slide uh, to uh, illustrate this, this notion, once you are exposed to a positive energy balance resulting from a combination of dietary factors and lack of physical activity, if your subcutaneous adipose tissue is not able to expand through fat cell uh, uh, hyperplasia, then you get the lipid spillover and the fat is going to uh, uh, accumulate in normally lean tissue in the abdominal cavity and in the liver, the heart, the muscle, the kidney, pancreatic fat, a phenomenon that has been described as ectopic fat uh, deposition. So this is why excess visceral adiposity is frequently accompanied by accumulation of uh, ectopic, ectopic fat. Now, uh, a question, and that, again, we have uh, uh, tried to address this question a, a long time ago in my lab. What if the expanded waistline is a result of excess subcutaneous adipose tissue accumulation as opposed to excess visceral fat? How can we distinguish that? Well, uh, we found that paying attention to a very, very simple marker, uh, triglyceride levels, was, uh, was useful, and this is why. Once you have this, uh, this uh, lipid spillover uh, leading to accumulation of fat in normal lean tissue, this will promote accumulation of fat in, in the liver. And to limit accumulation of fat in the liver, the liver will pump out more triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. So this is why very frequently excess visceral adipose tissue accumulation will be associated with elevated triglyceride concentrations uh, in the blood. And therefore, on the basis of this link, we, we have proposed uh, uh, in a paper published in, in circulation more than 20 years ago, we have described this phenotype uh, that we call hypertriglyceridemic waste, a combination of an elevated waistline with elevated triglyceride levels. And we did sensitivity and specificity analysis to determine the triglyceride and waist circumference cutoff that would give us the best discrimination uh, between those who are likely to be visceral obese as opposed to those who would be uh, uh, characterized by subcutaneous uh, adiposity. And we end up with these cutoff values in men, 20 centimeters of waistline in men, 2 millimoles per liter of triglyceride, and in women, 85 centimeter waist circumference and 1.5 millimoles per liter of triglyceride. Now, if you do a PubMed on hypertriglyceridemic waste, you'll find several papers that have looked at the ability of this very, very simple phenotype, not only to identify, discriminate for visceral obesity, but also uh, 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 to what extent this phenotype is predictive of various uh, clinical outcome. And we had the, the privilege, the opportunity to collaborate with uh, colleagues here at the University of Cambridge, Katie Ka and, and Nick Wareham in the EPIC uh, uh, Norfolk study. And I'll show you here two slides from uh, an analysis conducted on a sample of uh, a little less than 22,000 subjects, follow-up of, of eight years. You can see a, a, a consequent number of uh, coronary heart disease uh, events. And when you look here at the Kaplan-Meier survival curve of those men without hypertriglyceridemic waste versus those with hypertriglyceridemic waste, you can see the pointer from my pr uh, previous talk, I guess, which is, uh, sorry about that. 
So you can see that they are marked a difference in the survival uh, 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 remaining free from coronary heart disease. And if you have only elevated triglyceride or elevated waste in, in isolation, you're in, you're in between. And same result in women, a very nice uh, survival uh, act actually among women with low waste and low triglyceride. And you can see that having hypertriglyceridemic waste in women was associated with a reduced uh, probability of remaining free from, from CHD over the, the, uh, the follow-up. So this is uh, about excess visceral adiposity, ectopic fat, very uh, simple uh, introduction here, linking with the, the insulin resistance syndrome and, and clinical outcome. I moved actually uh, three years ago from the Quebec Heart and Lung Institute to launch a, a primary care uh, research center in, in Quebec to bring this to primary care uh, practice because there is a huge gap in, in Canada between what we know in terms of uh, precision lifestyle medicine and what we do in, in primary care. And I'll show you now a, a few slides showing you the relevance of uh, paying attention to what I've called simple lifestyle uh, risk factor. How can we uh, monitor abdominal adiposity, cardiovascular fitness, nutritional quality, and, and physical um, activity? So uh, going back now to the importance of adding waist uh, circumference to the body mass index, I'll show you here pool analysis uh, conducted by the Mayo Clinic, uh, 650,000 individuals follow up of, of nine years. And what you see here are some BMI categories and I'll, let's pay attention to a perfectly, presumably perfectly normal BMI category here. And what you have here is the mortality hazard ratio uh, with associated with five centimeter increments. So every subgroup here has a five centimeter uh, larger waist circumference. And you can see the perfectly within a normal BMI category, a perfectly linear relationship between waist circumference and mortality risk in every BMI category considered. Which means that if as a clinician, once you have established the BMI, you're not measuring waist circumference, you have no idea of what you're doing. This must be a very, very important si vital sign assess in clinical practice. So therefore, in Canada, I'm pushing really hard to move from the healthy weight public message to healthy waste public health uh, message. Now, uh, another important uh, phenotype to assess in clinical practice would be uh, cardiorespiratory fitness. This is my old friend, uh, Steve Blair, uh, very old work published in the JAMA in 89 from the Cooper Clinic showing that when you are in the first quintile of cardiovascular fitness, performance of a, a treadmill test, compared to those with a proper level of fitness, your risk of coronary heart disease is not increased by two, threefold, like the risk associated with hypertension, diabetes, or dyslipidemia. It is increased by eight to ninefold. And uh, Steve and, and Tim Church, in a cohort of men with uh, diabetes, explore the, the link uh, of uh, cardiovascular fitness and, and BMI uh, with uh, uh, mortality risk. And what you can see here is the survival probability of those individuals who, were, who had diabetes, who were overweight and obese, but who performed well at the treadmill test, as opposed to those who were normal weight, but who had a, a low fitness level, which led to this conclusion, and don't get me wrong, if you have type 2 diabetes, it's okay to target weight loss, but it's more dangerous to be poorly fit than to be overweight and um, obese. And this is another very important message to convey to the lay public, and this is why a few years ago, uh, we put together this uh, working group at the American Heart Association and published this uh, paper for those of you interested making that plea and re reviewing extensively the literature available, suggesting that we should make cardiovascular fitness a, a vital sign in, in clinical practice. Now, what, what is it behind this fat and fit um, uh, individual? I was interested by, by looking at that from a, a adipose tissue distribution perspective, and this is a lifestyle intervention study, three-year lifestyle intervention study that we published a few years ago in a sample of men who were all selected on the basis of their excess visceral adiposity. I'm not sure if you can see that from the back, but what, what you have here are individual changes in visceral adiposity after three years. So you can see that about 85% of our subject lost 
variable amount of visceral adipose tissue. But one of our most successful subjects in terms of loss of visceral adipose tissue didn't lose any weight. Actually, he gained 0.3 kilo. So if your outcome when you're intervening with a lifestyle intervention is weight loss, this would be a failure. This is a perfect success, you know, full normalization of his risk factor profile in the absence of weight loss because he lost a considerable amount of visceral adipose tissue. This is another of the subjects which is illustrated here. You can see after a year, massive loss of visceral adipose tissue, but he's still diagnosed as being obese, whereas he's perfectly uh, uh, healthy from a cardiometabolic risk uh, profile standpoint. Another of the subjects here who were barely uh, overweight, not losing weight after a year, but losing a significant amount of visceral fat and dropping his weight line by six centimeters. And um, we also did a, a study here in a sample of 100 patient with type 2 diabetes who had coronary artery bypass surgery, so patient with documented CHD, same lifestyle intervention here, and you can see the mobilization of AP pericardial fat, mobilization of visceral fat in the absence of weight loss. And we published, for those of you, a systematic review suggesting that indeed exercise might be a very interesting modality to selectively mobilize visceral adiposity. And I won't have time to show that result, but it is also a very relevant modality to mobilize those ectopic fat depots, particularly liver fat. Now, nutritional quality. Um, this is probably my favorite uh, nutrition trial, the PREDIMED uh, trial, sample of a study conducted in Spain, very large sample size. You can see that these subjects were on average characterized by obesity, large waistline, 50% of them had type 2 diabetes. Uh, they were asked the intervention groups to follow a Mediterranean type of diet supplemented by olive oil and nuts no weight loss and actually an increase in the total fat content of the diet in the intervention arm. This was associated with a 30% reduction in the incidence of uh, cardiovascular uh, events in the absence of uh, weight loss. And I'm not saying that weight loss is not appropriate, don't get me wrong. Now, in, in, in North America, we, uh, I'm not an expert in, in, in nutrition, but our, our colleagues have uh, 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 made the point that maybe, you know, in terms of, uh, we have failed in translating, you know, a, a, a message to the public in terms of healthy diet because we have been too technical and maybe being food-based uh, uh, in our recommendation would increase the likelihood that we are understood by, by, the, lay, uh, by the lay public. And I like this study, um, a lot, very simple one, uh, published by Dari Mozafarian in the, in the New England um, a decade ago. Uh, the, the analysis from the two uh, nurses uh, study and the health professional follow-up. And what uh, Dari Mozafarian here did was looking at specific food items. And you'll see, no surprise here, associated with weight gain or weight loss over four-year follow-up. Chips, fries, processed meat, red meat, sweets, dessert, refined grain, sweet, sugar-sweetened beverages, and weight loss, vegetable, nuts, whole grain, fruits, and yogurt. And on that basis, uh, Darius proposed that maybe in our uh, recommendation to the lay public, to our patient, we could, we could simplify the conversations and suggesting you should have more of this and less of that, and therefore then you can, you can, play, you can manipulate the, the diet to improve overall Nutritional, nutritional quality. And lastly now, uh, physical activity. Uh, this is one of my uh, favorite slides. It's coming again. I want to pay tribute to our colleagues in, the, in Cambridge here. This is from the EPIC uh, Norfolk um, a study, a 10,000 men follow up of almost 11 years. And what you have here is the risk of corneal disease associated with the presence of the metabolic syndrome. I was asked not to forget about the metabolic syndrome. Well, many, many studies have shown that if you're characterized by the clinical criteria of the metabolic syndrome, your risk of corneal disease, you can see here in men and in women, is increased, no surprise. We've been knowing that for more than a decade. But in EPIC Norfolk, with their questionnaire, they can stratify their subjects on the basis of their level of physical activity. Look at this here. This is phenomenal. <laughs> 
look at the low incidence of coronary heart disease among those men and women who have the feature of the metabolic syndrome, but who are physically active. Don't you think that it's an important message to convey to the lay public rather than what I hear sometimes when I drink my coffee in the morning, that it's difficult to lose weight with exercise. You should put yourself on a diet. I don't think the message is, is, is adequate. Physical activity provide cardio protection, irrespective of whether or not you, you, lose, uh, you lose weight. And lastly, coming back to this issue of nutritional uh, quality, we have used a very simple food-based questionnaire to classify our, uh, a sample of 5,000 uh, workers here into uh, a, a subgroup having poor nutritional quality, average or high nutritional quality. And I just want to show you uh, one slide. And we did that. I can explain later on. We had a mobile unit to, to do this. And this is the score uh, uh, of nutritional quality based on 25 food-based questions that our participant uh, answered. And this is the, the important slide. When you stratified again these subjects into level of physical activity, this is the epic Norfolk questionnaire and their level of nutritional quality. Look at this. This is textbook. If you have a poor overall diet and you are sedentary, look at the prevalence of hypertriglyceridemic waste because we didn't CT scan those subjects. Look at the marked difference compared to those who are active who have a high nutritional quality. If we measure Fitness, we use a submaximal treadmill test. The data is even better. You can see here that if you have a poor fitness compared, uh, 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 in addition to having a poor quality diet, look at the prevalence of visceral obesity as opposed to if you are fit and have a diet of high nutritional quality. Very simple life, lifestyle vital signs that could be measured in clinical practice. Look at the huge discrimination we get uh, uh, in terms of prevalence of a marker of uh, visceral um, obesity. So in closing, unfortunately, uh, despite the fact that I have shared those simple tools, hopefully, that will be helpful in clinical practice, clinical practice, even improved, will not fix this. Uh, we need to fill the gap between clinical individual so, uh, approaches and population-based solution, and that's why I moved to a primary care center to try to get closer to uh, public health uh, uh, solution. And this will be my, my last slide in this area of precision medicine. Let's me, let me propose that we need to enter the area of precision lifestyle medicine. We clearly need to go beyond the body mass index here and refer to obesity. There are simple tools to assess the risk associated with a given overweight obesity phenotype. I'm absolutely convinced that the last opportunity is to measure those lifestyle vital signs. If something is important in business, it has to be assessed and targeted. We don't do that in clinical practice regarding the behaviors. And we need also to target the health challenge environment. Thank you very much for kind attention. Thank you.